see the snow still on the ground. Go back to June. I took over here. In June? Is that what you said? Is that what I heard? Yeah. In June? No, I've been here in June. It's 106. <laughs> it's wonderful to be back with some uh, wonderful friends. And, uh, all day long, I've been uh, running into people that I really spent an enormous amount of time with back in 2007 and early part of 2008. And by the way, you know, the first chapter of the book that I released about a year and a half ago called uh, Do the Right Thing, the first chapter of the book was called I Love Iowa. Ah. And uh, I hope some of you have read it. If you haven't, you should. <laughs> Especially the first chapter. You really like it. When I talk about the night of the caucuses as we've gone over to Waterloo to uh, be there for one of the caucus events, we got as close as we could in the car. And then we had to walk over ice and snow and treacherously about 500 yards to get to the school where the caucus was being held. When we left there, the car was blocked in and we couldn't get out. And we were in a desperate rush. We needed to get back to Des Moines for the caucus watch and all the activities. And we realized the car is hopelessly blocked in. We're never going to get out of there because there was a lot more people that had shown up than ever had been anticipated. So we finally uh, literally stopped the car at an intersection. It was a kid who was home from college. We commandeered him and his car, and he agreed to drive us over to the airport so we could get a uh, flight back over here uh, in a little uh, small airplane that had no heat. <laughs> we were dying. <laughs> I had the coat over my head. We were wearing gloves. It was my wife and me and two of our staff members. And we were huddled up like this. And as we were coming into Des Moines, our blackberries all started just going nuts. <laughs> and we couldn't figure out what in the world. It's like something major. And as we were coming in, we started reading our messages. And it turned out that everyone in the world knew that we had won the Iowa caucuses but us. We were the last. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what a great uh, experience it was then. But I'm not here today to talk about what was. I'm here today to talk about what can be. I think all of you know that uh, Bob Vanderplatz and I got to be very close friends, not just associates and political allies, but close friends during the course of the campaign. And there were many friendships formed. Danny Carroll and his wife, Joy, uh, I will consider for the rest of my life as dear personal friends. Uh, there's so many throughout this state that you spend that much time with, you visit with them, you go to their homes, you get to know their kids, and it's far beyond the realm of politics. But in the context of all of those relationships and opportunities to visit, you get to know something about a person, not what they say at the podium and not what the position papers are that they publish. You get to know something about a person when he or she is off stage and tired and late at night. And you find out whether what's inside of them is as real as what you see out there in the public uh, moment. And when Bob asked me to come back and be a part of his campaign and help him. It was not hard for me to say, of course I will. Because having been a governor for 10 and a half years, I think I know something about the various qualities that make for a good governor. And I find every one of them involved. And I'm uh, very, very happy to be able to, uh, to be here today because uh, quite frankly, many of you in this room, because of your strong positions, in your commitment to the sanctity of every human life, your belief that marriage hasn't changed, it still means one man, one woman, relationship for life. Because of your commitment to the idea that moms and dads really do raise better kids than governments ever will, and the idea that small business really is the engine of the American economy, and if 85% of the new jobs are created by small business, uh, the government doesn't need to do everything it can to make it hard for small businesses to survive, they need to do everything possible to make it so that small businesses can really thrive, not just survive. The key to ending unemployment is really opening up the marketplace so that a person who sits down at their kitchen table and sketches out an idea for a business on a, a napkin and talking about it with their wife can actually see that come to fruition. That can never happen if their biggest competitor turns out to be their own government. And that's why the election cycle that we're in right now in 2010 may be a turning point, not just for Iowa, but for all of America. There have been a lot of encouraging signs. The Tea Parties 
have been to me one of the greatest signs of American revival I have seen. And I know that some people still don't understand the phenomenon, but let me try to explain for those who don't get it. The Tea Party activists, for the most part, are not the traditional political operatives who have signed up to be committee workers and normally go to the political party events. Uh, they historically are not the ones who have been lined up with candidates, and their involvement in politics is not about getting appointed to some board or commission or some agency. They're not interested in being an ambassador somewhere. These are mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, small business owners, self-employed people who woke up to a rapidly changing country and said, enough. and who decided that they really did believe in the American ideal that we the people ultimately rule. And it's been a very wonderful, positive explosion of expression of the true American spirit. I was asked earlier today, what do I think about uh, many of the folks who have been Tea Party activists and how the maybe members of the political ruling class have accepted them? I said, uh, much to my surprise, some of them have been contemptuous. I can recall the comic by Nancy Pelosi, who said that it was nothing more than astroturf, artificial grassroots movement. I can think of the video exchanges that we've all now seen, some of them be rather celebrated, with members of Congress yelling and screaming and arguing with the people that are their bosses. I don't know where you guys have worked. I, I would imagine that you've had a similar kind of experience as mine. When you yell at your boss, you usually get fired. <laughs> <laughs> it's and okay when the boss yells at the employee, but the employee rarely yells at the boss. We've got members of Congress who don't understand who the boss is Amen. and who works for who. Yeah. And that's why I think the Tea Party movement has been a great reminder that ultimately American citizens, ordinary people who pay the taxes and make it all work, are the ones we better start listening to again. Amen. Today I'm delighted to uh, be able to visit with many of you in this room. And some of you are longtime Republican activists sometimes. Many of you perhaps are independents. Maybe a sprinkling of Democrats here and there. I don't know. I hope that more than you're committed to a particular political party, you are committed to particular principles that start with the idea that all of us are created equal and are endowed by our creators with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It starts with an idea that every person has equal worth and value. No person is worth more than another. No person is worth less than another. And whether that person is unborn, just born, born for a while, born for a whole long time and getting near the finish line, that person has that value and worth, and the sanctity of that life at any level should be protected by the government and not held with some level of disdain. Amen. Bob Vanderplatz is a pro-life person, not because that is a politically convenient position for him to take, but because he knows that the day that we begin to disrespect <coughs> one person within a culture, one person whose life has less value, then one day a person may decide that one of us have less, has less value. That's why the pro-life position is not just about unborn children, though it certainly is that. It's about every human life, every human being. And it is the most consistent point of view with our founders who believe that all of us are created equal. 